Please stop. Minister Lin Sui Sek, Mr. Ho Kwon Ping, Professor Arnold de Meyer, Professor Rahendra Sri Bastava, faculty students and staff of Singapore Management University, members of my delegation, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. After hearing that very inspired speech, I'm, um, shall we say, intimidated as I may be so pale in comparison, especially coming after the three distinguished politicians of our generation who have delivered the three previous speeches. Hopefully you will not live to regret uh, if I do fail your expectations. <laughs> I come to your country today at a time of renewed optimism in our part of the world. Here in Singapore, the economy is well on the way to recovering from the last global economic downturn and is seeing an awakening in its arts and culture. My country is experiencing a surge in confidence as my government aggressively pushes programs to encourage private investments, alleviate mass poverty, and battle corruption. But in another part of the world, people are rising up to overthrow their leaders. Some of these uprisings have ended peacefully and in a relatively orderly manner. Others have degenerated to violence and uncertainty. Still others, are just starting and the responses of the governments in question will determine whether those leaders survive or are thrown out, thrown to the dustbin of history. This reaffirms two fundamental truths. First, that governments exist at the sovereigns and authority of its people, regardless of political system. And second, that the government's strength lies in its responsiveness to its people's dreams and aspirations. When a government begins to lose sight of these two truisms, when the focus shifts to the tension of power to the exclusion of everything else, then change becomes inevitable. This change is often initiated by disaffected youth, mostly well-educated and eager for professional rewards that the economy is too weak to offer. And when they coalesce with the middle class, the collective voice becomes too strong for tyrants to ignore. My country's economy has been for the past decade far from ideal. And this was compounded by numerous scandals and allegations that beset my predecessor's administration. Yet it appeared that paralysis had crept among our youth, who had seemingly grown so cynical and apathetic that the only dream left for them was to leave the country. Then came 2010, and a new version of people power emerged. The same emotions that fueled the EDSA revolution in 1986 were harnessed by my people. In the Philippine elections of 2010, 25 years ago, we stopped tax last year. We overcame vaunted political machineries, massive logistics, and a seemingly bottomless campaign war chest. The spirit of people power catapulted to the presidency an opposition figure who at first was even reluctant to run. We see in history, from Marcos to Mubarak, the world has marveled at formidable political titans being toppled by no other means than a collective expression of outrage by the unarmed. What these toppled leaders had in common was that they came to represent both the unwillingness and inability, not just of a leader, but of an entire governing system to respond to the needs of the times and to the legitimate clamor of their peoples. Ailing former statesmen, presiding over ailing governments and characterized by old ailing economies, confronted by young populations unable to find work or an outlet for their dissatisfaction, Joined by a middle class whose patience has been taxed to the breaking point, erupted into revolution. As the president of a nation that put the phrase people power on the political and ideological map, I would argue that no nation and no people have viewed people power as an end goal, but rather as the instrument of last resort. Those nations that have never had to face people power must seek a meeting of the minds with those who have lived through it if only both can recognize a fundamental lesson about power in general. Nations endure when their leaders remain responsive to the people and when their institutions continue to evolve. The fundamental aspirations are the same, prosperity for all, personal and collective security, an orderly succession in the leadership, and of course, the rule of law. In a word, power lies in the ability to forge the kinds of consensus that allow leaders to recognize that the time has come to make way for a new generation of leaders. And where everything from regulations to institutions 
can be refashioned and in a sense refreshed to better address the material and aspirational needs of society. Southeast Asia has had its people power era. Countries like my own had to resort to people power to bring down governments that would not give way and would not give up, leading Filipinos to give their leaders ultimatums. Both Filipinos and Singaporeans have our own traditions, our unique histories, and our particular political institutions. What our systems and institutions have in common is their commitment to remain responsive to the people's needs. We recognize the shared ambitions that if hindered, lead to a rising crescendo of complaints, or if addressed, lead to social harmony and political solidarity. At the heart of the matter is a respect for the markets, an abhorrence for corruption, an insistence on accountability, and the shift toward mentorship and meritocracy in our respective political spheres. This is true in the political sphere, and this is true in the business sphere as well. The strongest and best companies are those who have a workforce that does not measure their professionalism through punching time cards, and who are willing to go the extra mile in pursuit of the shared vision. I am fortunate to have a committed cabinet, members of which have salaries that would amount to perhaps a single digit percentage of their expense accounts had they chosen to remain in the private sector. But they instead chose to join the Filipino people in this time of hope. Here we find more common ground. Our leaders are committed to fulfilling the visions for our respective states. Within our own cultural and political milieus, we have arrived at a political consensus where we have our respective mechanisms for succession, where we have institutions that have adapted and are adaptive to rapidly changing economic and demographic conditions, and where increasingly the autonomy of the individual is being harmonized with the legitimate concerns of the whole. It has taken longer for some of us and shorter for others, but we have already put in place the necessary institutions and have arrived at the vital consensus that can move our respective countries forward and forge increasingly deeper and more meaningful ties among ASEAN nations. I return to events unfolding in the Middle East and North Africa today, where people power is again happening. Those of you who ask if this could happen here in our part of the world where it all began, need to ask only one question. Have our governments, whatever form they take, been able to successfully address the economic and political aspirations of their respective peoples? Your nation can clearly answer in the affirmative. Your government's vision and your people's passion to seeing its fulfillment serves as an inspiration to me and my people. My nation has its own challenges to overcome, but I'm certain that no one doubts that we are on the right track. We are well on our way to healing a wounded national psyche. We are ridding ourselves of the cycle of despair and mediocrity. The whole world is seeing this today, armed with a new form of people power where the old, ailing ways are cast aside in favor of new aspirations and new solutions, and where the spirit of hope overcomes not just tax, but cynicism, paralysis, and apathy. The Filipino people will reclaim its rightful place in the community of nations. Thank you. Good day.